All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Olivia Miller, and I'm the Curator of Exhibitions at the University of Arizona Museum of Art. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this special program, Spotlights on Provenance, the Crest Collection. Research on provenance, the history of ownership of an object, is an important part of maintaining a museum collection. And in today's program, you will hear in detail about the lives of three incredible paintings from the UAMA. So before we delve into the topic, today's program, hold on. There we go, there's those three beautiful paintings. <laughs> uh, before we delve into the topic of today's program, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Arizona sits on the original homelands of indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial, including the Tahana Otham and Pasquayaki. Aligning with the university's core value of a diverse and inclusive community, it is an institutional responsibility to recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up the Wildcat community. At the institutional level, it is important to be proactive and broadening awareness throughout campus to ensure our students feel represented and valued. For those of you joining us from other cities or states, I encourage you to learn what indigenous lands you inhabit. I would like to extend a special thanks to our museum members who have continued their support through this difficult year. It is because of them that we've been able to continue our educational programs despite the switch to a virtual format. For today's program, I will provide a brief background on the Crest Collection, and then I will hand it over to Dr. Irene Romano, who will explain the specialty of provenance research and how she created a seminar course around it. She in turn will introduce today's speakers, Emily Hager, Sedona Heidinger, and Nicholas McCullough, who will each present their research on the three paintings from the Crest Collection. We will be keeping participants muted throughout the program, but we do invite you to leave your questions in the chat for the speakers, and then we will save some time at the end to, to take some of those questions. There is a closed captioning feature um, that you're probably seeing right now. If you would like to hide the subtitles, just click on the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen and click hide transcript. So with that, a little bit about Samuel Cress. So Samuel H. Cress opened his first five and dime store in 1896. Over the years, he grew his company to more than 250 Cress stores throughout the United States. And it's from this commercial success that he was able to travel and collect art. So on the left-hand side, I'm just showing you a portrait of Samuel Cress. In the center is an example of a Cress store. I believe this one was in Ohio. And um, even if you didn't uh, shop at Cress stores, you might see the relics of the buildings. Um, many of them are considered to be architectural masterpieces. And so many of the buildings do still survive in various cities. And then on the right-hand side, I love this photograph. It's um, a view of one of the bedrooms in Cress's apartment in New York. And um, part of the reason why I love it is that the, the painting that's closest to the ceiling above the bed in the center is part of the UAMA collection. So here you see it in one place. And then when you come to our museum, you can see it at the museum. Between the years 1929 to 1961, Samuel, along with the assistance of his brothers, Claude and Rush, organized an extensive loan program um, that traveled around the country. So here I'm showing you a newspaper article from when the University of Arizona received 25 objects on loan. Uh, the photograph in the upper right-hand corner is showing you students visiting this exhibition. This was when we had um, an art gallery at the library and that's where the paintings were lent. Um, and that painting that they're looking at is their Vernet. That's the one that Nicholas McCullough will be speaking about. Um, so after the loan, uh, the Samuel Crest Foundation ended up donating 64 objects to the University of Arizona. And I'm showing you at the lower right, that is the ribbon cutting ceremony of the Samuel H. Crest collection at the UAMA. So the Crest family had strong ties to Tucson. Uh, Rush's wife, Virginia, was a UA alum and they spent a lot of time here. Um, they attended church at St. Phillips in the Hills and um, that church on River and Campbell actually has pieces from the Crest Collection as well, which you can go and see. And so it is largely because of this gift that the, from the Crest Foundation that the Arizona legislature finally approved funding to build the Fine Arts Complex and the Museum of Art. So if you have ever been to the UAMA, you have certainly seen the Crest Collection, which has been on permanent display since 1961. Uh, this is a, an old photograph of the gallery. Um, one of the 
I guess silver linings to this, this closure that we've had is that we've taken this opportunity to um, refresh the Crest Galleries. So they will have a new look and when we reopen, you will see them um, in a different way. Uh, the Crest Foundation remains quite active through their grant support and professional development opportunities for scholars, uh, museum professionals, librarians, um, and they also assist with research. So today I would like to thank um, Max Marmer, president of the Crest Foundation, who did provide us access um, for Emily Hager's presentation on the Lucas Cronach painting. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Irene Bald Romano. Dr. Romano holds a joint appointment as Professor of Art History in the School of Art and Professor of Anthropology in the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona. She also holds affiliated appointments in the Department of Religious Studies and Classics and in the Center for Middle Eastern Studies and is Curator of Mediterranean Archaeology at the Arizona State Museum. Prior to her positions at the University of Arizona, she held various roles at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Philadelphia and worked as the executive director of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. In addition to extensive archaeological field experience, she is the author or co-author of seven books, as well as numerous articles on ancient Mediterranean collections, Greek and Roman sculpture, pottery, terracotta figurines, Greek cult practice, and marble provenance studies. Her current research is focused on the fate of antiquities in the Nazi era in collaboration with 15 international scholars and inspired by her participation in the German-American Provenance Research Exchange Program in 2018. So with that incredible background, please welcome Dr. Romano. Thank you, Olivia. And uh, the students and I want to express how very grateful we are to you and to Kristen Schmidt for facilitating our research um, remotely and giving us access to the collections and the, um, the collections files in order to, uh, to do the research. There were, um, there were 12 graduate students in my, um, let me advance this, um, 12 graduate students in my uh, fall 2020 Provenance Research Seminar. Uh, and for their research projects, each uh, student chose a work of art or a collection in UAMA or in another institution in Tucson or elsewhere. Uh, in the end, students undertook research on a great variety of cases, uh, ancient Greek vases in the Arizona State Museum, uh, two Roman sculptures in the J. Paul Getty Museum, a, a Durer print, two uh, Goya prints, and the George O'Keefe painting in UAMA, uh, two 17th century British table carpets in the Met, um, an Inuit collection in North Carolina, a photography collection of African-American jockeys at the Kentucky Derby, and an 1890s Russian photo album. All of these were fascinating, but the three presentations you will hear today, as Olivia mentioned, are bound together by their focus on paintings in the Samuel H. Crest Collection at UAMA. First, what is provenance? Uh, strictly speaking, it is the ownership history of a work of art. This all seems very straightforward, but you will see from these presentations how complicated it is to produce complete provenance information for a particular work of art, why it matters, and how it sheds light on the use and reuse, the context and recontextualization of a work of art, and sometimes it's changing interpretations and understandings. We took a very broad view of provenance and embraced a concept of object biographies, which recognizes that each object or work of art has a dynamic history, uh, a, a rich story to tell, beginning with its creation and following its life cycle through its varied uses, transfers, and interactions uh, with its owners, whether they might be individuals or institutions, right up to the present day. The entire object biography is rarely recoverable and there are often gaps in the provenance information. The techniques and resources for this kind of research are varied and include at the very beginning, a close examination of the work of art itself with a conservator if possible. Uh, its dimensions, materials, state of preservation, signs of restoration, the artist's signature, 
the frame and importantly the back of the frame, backing board or the canvas itself, which often have notations, stamps, or stickers that provide details of its history of ownership of exhibitions or shipping details, for example. Uh, the backs of, uh, of uh, the back of a painting tells the itinerary of a painting. And here are just some examples on the left, um, two overlapping prints on the back of a Durer print in UAMA of a well-known print collector, Dr. Albert Blum. Uh, in the middle, the brand of Charles I of England, which was used on most, but not all of the works in his collection. And on the right, uh, a stamp of the ERR, one of the main Nazi agencies for uh, art looting, art confiscation from 1940 to 1944. And here's a Christie's employing, uh, showing us the back of an early 20th century painting with all kinds of uh, interesting markings written in, uh, in pen and, and ink and chalk, it looks like and also with these stickers that are applied to the back. This was a very common um, practice until fairly recently for a, a painting, for example, that went on loan to another institution or to a gallery for that museum, for that institution to affix a, um, a sticker to the back of the, of the frame to help them to, to track the, uh, the work of art. Uh, secondly, is the study of uh, the artist, uh, him or herself. Um, the milieu, the, the oeuvre of the artist, the time period, the dealers and collaborators with whom the artist worked, how their work was disseminated, uh, and of course, consulting the major scholarly publications, including the catalogue raisonné, if one exists. And here's the uh, International Foundation for Art Research page. Uh, a very easy resource for looking up the, the main scholarly sources on a particular um, artist, including uh, the catalog raisonné. Thirdly, archival information, and this is plentiful. First, there are archives of uh, the artist, uh, the collector, auction houses, uh, dealers, and more and more of these are being digitized and made available online by uh, museums and research institutions. There are museum records that might include acquisition information, including deeds of gift, bills of sale, appraisals, letters between the, um, the museum and the, um, the seller, catalog cards that might include notations from scholars who came to visit the museum and noticed something and made a comment about the, um, the attribution or the, uh, the iconography. Um, and the, the last category, photographs of um, a work of art in a collector's home or in a, a museum setting, um, document the changing history and the, the use of works of art. And here are a couple of examples. A, um, an auction catalog of, of a famous sale in Lucerne, Switzerland in 1939, where so-called degenerate art was sold. This is art that was confiscated from uh, German museums by the Nazis and declared uh, unequal to the, um, the official sort of Aryan um, ideology. Uh, and this catalog um, is in the, the, uh, the Getty Research Institute and it's an annotated one. They, they have a number of them from this particular sale and they each give us a little bit more information. This one happens to be um, the catalog that was owned by Douglas Cooper who was in at this sale, uh, a British monuments man and art critic and, and collector. And he was making notes and you can see here the, um, the, uh, the asking price and he's translating from Swiss francs to dollars. Uh, and finally he records the hammer price for this particular painting. And then you see here in blue, the name Vertime. And uh, this, by the, by the way, the, this is the, um, the entry in the catalog for the um, 1888 Van Gogh self-portrait, the one that he dedicated to his then good friend, uh, Paul Gauguin. So um, Vertime refers to Maurice Vertime. He was the uh, individual who purchased this uh, painting at, at that auction. And uh, 
he was uh, an American um, investment banker and, uh, and collector, and he attended Harvard University as an undergraduate, and he bequeathed this painting to uh, the Fogg Art Museum in 1951, where it still is today in what's now known as the Harvard Art Museums. So this helps um, and you understand how this explains um, more about the, the sale price, of course, and who the, uh, the, the seller was. Photographs then, of course, can be both the subjects of provenance research and they are valuable tools for provenance research. And here in these two beautiful photographs, you see on the left, uh, the, the Paris residence of Calouste Gulbenkian, a uh, well-known um, collector who uh, was called Mr. 5%. He only, he only selected the 5% best of anything in any particular sale. And uh, he had a, a diverse collection and, and including a large collection of Middle Eastern decorative arts. But you see his, his art collection, the way he had um, arranged it in his particular, this particular residence. And then on the right, a beautiful portrait of Jacques Lipschitz in his Hastings on Hudson Studio in New York in 1964. Uh, and we see him with some of his own works of art on the mantle and then behind him, works of African art that inspired him in his work. So for the Cress works of art, we had the advantage of beginning with the Cress Foundation's archives and the, the provenance information that was provided by the National Gallery of Arts, Nancy Yidey, who is the, the godmother, as it were, of provenance research on European paintings. And she is the author of the uh, American Association of Museums 2001 Guide to um, Provenance Research. Beginning in 2010, um, Nancy Yardy conducted provenance research for the Samuel H. Crest Foundation on Crest collections across the United States, including in UAMA. So the job of the students, therefore, was to confirm the existing provenance information, look more deeply at each of the ownership transfers um, to try to illuminate the how, when, and why of each, and to shed more light on the owners of the paintings. Uh, in other words, to fill in between the lines. Provenance research is not uh, a methodology that's typically taught in art history departments in the United States. So in a sense, we were breaking new ground last semester. We studied the history of the art trade in various periods notable collectors and their collecting practices, art dealers and their practices, and the role of auction houses. Uh, we also examined the tools and the sources of provenance information and how to access that information. We discussed why provenance research is important, including the way in which it is often part of the evidence for or against the authenticity of a work of art. And we looked closely at some of the historical issues um, on which provenance research has been closely focused over the last 30 years or so, uh, and which have driven forward the field of provenance research. Namely, first, uh, the complicated and troubling issues surrounding the plunder of art from Jewish collectors in Europe by the Nazis between 1933 and 1945. For the Nazi period, it is not enough to understand who owned the painting and in what years. Uh, it is critical to understand how the work of art was transferred, confiscated by the Nazis, sold under duress by a Jewish owner who needed to escape Nazi occupied Europe, or legitimately sold at a fair market value. These are very thorny questions. Uh, the second um, bullet there, the antiquities trade with uh, the ongoing issues of illicit digging and transfers from, from so-called source countries to market countries, especially problematic now in conflict zones in the Middle East. And with regard to antiquities, uncovering the provenience, that is the archeological find spot is critical to establishing the full biography of the object, but which is often sadly lost in, um, in the market transfers. And thirdly, colonial era 
acquisitions, uh, which is a very hot topic recently and encompasses a broad chronology and, uh, and geography in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, uh, and the Americas. We also talked about exhibiting provenance. The museum public is deeply interested in knowing the backstory about works of art, their owners, uh, transfers, and uses. Uh, and the students and I discussed how museums has, have dealt with this issue or not. And I show you two examples here. And in 2017-18, the Cranert Art Museum at the University of Illinois did a special exhibition called Provenance, a, a Forensic History of Art. Uh, and the J. Paul Getty Museum has a gallery that they um, put up in 2019 and is still there, uh, devoted to the history of um, some of the objects in their collection. And this is a small bronze statuette of Luna or Nix uh, of the Roman period that um, has a complicated history, including during the Nazi period. And it was um, restituted to the individual who owned it during that period and then put up for auction where the J. Paul Getty Museum purchased it. So with that introduction on the subject in general, I'm happy to introduce our three University of Arizona um, student presenters in order of their presentations. First, Emily Hager is a graduate student in art history in the accelerated master's degree program in which a student earns a BA and MA in five years. Her special interests are Nazi era confiscations and restitution claims and her MA thesis will focus on some Nazi era case studies. She chose to work on a painted panel of the Madonna and Child by the studio of Lucas Cranach, uh, the provenance of which has some challenging issues, including some enigmatic transfers during the Nazi period. The second speaker will be Sedona Heidinger, who is a graduate student in art history, uh, just transitioning from the master's degree program to the PhD program. Her PhD dissertation will be on mysticism in modern painting, focusing on women artists in the Southwest and West. Today, she will highlight aspects of the biography of Elisabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun's 1793 portrait of the Countess von Schoenfeld and her daughter. Sedona is the recipient of the 2021 Susan Kornhaber Art History Scholarship for her research in UAMA, and she will be integrating her research on this Vigée Lebrun portrait in further programming. Nicholas McCullough will present Horace Vernet's 1830 portrait of the Marchesa Gunaconda Michiatelli with her infant son and his nurse. Nicholas completed his BA and MA in four and a half years in December 2020 with a brilliant MA thesis entitled Consorts of Power, contextualizing the state portrait costumes worn by the wives of the French monarchs from 1774 to 1870. He is now working in Tucson and considering his future. So with that, I will stop sharing and call on um, Emily for her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Romano. Let's see. Is that okay? Everyone can see? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I will be discussing a panel painting on wood of the Virgin and Child attributed to Luca, the studio of Lucas Cranach, uh, the elder, dating from about 1513 to 1514. Uh, early 16th century Germany was a revolutionary place. Religion, politics, and art collided in a spectacular fashion, with the epicenter being a small town called Witten Wittenberg in the region of Saxony. Revolutionaries, reformers, artists, and the common, common churchgoer all played integral roles in the Saxon town in 1517. Our story begins slightly before, however, when a young painter was invited to the court of the elder Sac uh, el bleh of the elector of Saxony's Frederick III in 1505, launching his career, or launching the career of the 33-year-old Lucas von Cranach. Altar pieces are among the most exceptional and numerous of the works of Cranach in his studio, and the Virgin Mary was a popular subject. It is widely accepted that the crest Virgin and Child is the central panel for a triptych, with St. Catherine on the, on the left panel and St. Barbara on the right. 
The left wing completes the castle and its rocky landscape in the upper left-hand corner of the UMA panel, U UAMA panel. The two wings were acquired in 1911 by the Moravian Gallery, Borno, in the Czech Republic from Prince Johann II of Liechtenstein. That is their earliest known provenance. We are unsure when or why the triptych was split apart. Any history um, that the back of the panel may, might have told us is obscured by the so-called cradle or wooden support system. Because of the presence of the coat of arms in the lower left and right hand corners, we, we can be certain that the UAMA's virgin and child was commissioned by the elector of Saxony, Frederick III. What is unknown though, is where these panels would have been displayed, perhaps in a private chapel uh, in the elector's palace or in a local church. Here's the summary of the currently known provenance from the UAMA panel. Unfortunately, as you can see, uh, there's no documentation for this painting from the years 1513 or 1514 to the early 1800s. In 1822-1823 Christie sale catalog for the contents of William Beckford's Fontill Abbey in England contains a description possibly matching our virgin and child. The description for lot 87 with asterisk reads L. Cranach, the virgin and child interior with a romantic distant landscape. Blazonry is introduced at each corner of the, at the bottom, probably the arms of the noble for whom the picture was painted. The lot description does not include precise details that could confirm that the UAMA's virgin and child is the same as the Fontill virgin and child. For instance, there are no dimensions, medium of the painting, previous provenance history, or other crucial details. Secondly, the description virgin and child interior presents an issue. As we can see here, the virgin and the UAMA painting is clearly seated outdoors in a stepped garden with a tree behind her. To complicate matters further, an annotated copy of the same Christie's catalog in the Getty Research Institute notes that the painting was not included in the 1823 sale. The earliest recorded ex exhibition of the UAMA's Virgin and Child took place in 1899 Dresden. The owner of the painting was Baron Maximilian von Heil, pictured here. He would later found an art museum based on his own collection in the city of Worms, Germany, and he was an avid art collector, antiquarian, and philanthropist, responsible for also founding the Luther Library and Worms Antiquities Association. Baron von Heil was also listed as the owner of this painting in a Dusseldorf exhibition in 1904. In 1916, the Baron von Heil decided to part with the Cranach Virgin and Child. While it is not clear if he sold it outright or offered it on consignment, von Heil selected the Julius Boller Berler Gallery of Munich in May 1916. The Berler Gallery in Munich was extremely successful during this period, with partnerships in New York, Berlin, Lucerne, and helping many wealthy families, including Jewish families, build their art collections. The Berler dealership profited greatly from these relationships and close ties to the Nazi party during the period from 1933 to 1945. In November 1916, the Cranach painting was purchased by Hedwig Ullmann. She was born to a wealthy family in, in 18, 1872 and married Albert Ullmann. The Jewish couple lived in Frankfurt on Main, Germany, pictured here, um, and were art collectors with an eclectic collection of medieval portraiture, or sorry, medieval sculpture, porcelain, silver, and some paintings. While the scope of the Ullmann collection has not been fully studied, various oil paintings from their collection by Hans Thoma have been identified in the lost art database of Nazi looted art, and one was restituted to the Ullmann heirs in 2017, shown to have been sold by Hedwig under duress in 1938 in order to escape Nazi Germany. In 1934 and 1938, the Ullmanns were listed as the owners of the Virgin and Child in the German Directory of Nationally Valuable Works of Art. With the UAMA's permission, Dr. Romano and I have contacted a descendant of the Ullman family who holds the family's archives and attempts to gain clarity on what has happened to the UAMA painting during this period when the Ullmans were fleeing Nazi Germany. From passenger records, it's, it seems that the Ullman family fled Germany in March 1939 for Milan and by June permanently moved to Australia. Uh, the next known transfer of the paintings is in December 1940 to Paul Dre, who owned an art gallery in New York, but we do not know how or from whom he acquired it. Thus, these few years from 1838 
1938 and 1940 present a gap in provenance that needs to be further explored. I call these the wondering years. I present three possibilities for this period. First, Hedwig Ullmann may have sold the Virgin and Child in 18, I'm sorry, in 1938 or early 1939 before leaving for Milan, where she had two grown sons. That individual or dealer might have sold might have been sold to Paul Dre in New York in 1940. For the second possibility, there is documentation provided by uh, Maria Obenaus in her 2015 dissertation that the son of Alfred Walters, an art historian and dealer, obtained the Virgin and Child in Milan in 1938. This contradicts the information that Hedwig Ullman arrived in Milan in 1939. The last possibility comes from a one page article that stated the Ullmans left their pieces from their collection in the hands of a Jewish German art dealer, Arthur Kaufman, as he fled to London in 1938. It is likely Kaufman knew Ferenz Dre, a fellow German Jewish art dealer, emigre in London and relative of Paul Dre's, and he might have facilitated the sale of the painting to Paul Dre. All three theories are possibilities, but with flaws, and we hope this issue might be settled with more information from the Ullman family members or family archives. From 1940 onwards, the provenance of the Virgin and Child is relatively straightforward. While it is not clear how the Virgin and Child came to the hands of Paul Dre, it was first exhibited in the United States under his ownership. From December 1940 to January 1941, the William Rockhill Nelson Gallery of Kansas City, Missouri exhibited German, Fre Flemish, and Dutch paintings for its seventh anniversary, including the UAMA Cranach. Today, the Virgin and Child is housed at the UAMA thanks to the 1948 purchase of the painting by Samuel H. Kress, presumably from Paul Dre in New York. Here's the Virgin and Child's exhibition history. A noteworthy mention is the 1961-1962 Art Treasures for America from the Samuel H. Crest Foundation at the National Gallery of Art that President John F. Kennedy attended. Since then, the Virgin and Child has traveled internationally to Germany and Prague. Studying the provenance of this Cranach painting has been rewarding and challenging for me. In the coming months, I hope to be able to fill in some of the gaps in its ownership history and illuminate more of the story of its complicated itinerary and the people whose lives the painting is touched. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. We'll now turn to our next speaker, Sedona Heidinger. Thank you, Dr. Romano. I'll share my screen. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'll be sharing my research on the provenance of Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun's beautiful portrait in the UAMA, the Countess von Schoenfeld with her daughter. Um, I wanted to express my sincere gratitude to Susan Kornhaber for sponsoring me um, with the Art History Scholarship, so I dedicate my presentation to her today. So the provenance for this painting appears to be relatively straightforward at first glance, with clear transfers of custody at each stage in its journey throughout the centuries from Vienna to Tucson. As simple as this chain of ownership may be, both in terms of its chronological clarity and its relative stability of ownership, each successive transfer seemed to increase in complexity and nuance. Several factors contribute to this, which I intend to illustrate through interpretations of the trilingual correspondence surrounding this painting. These include concerns about changing cultural taste, efforts to maintain cordial relationships with mercurial patrons, and the quotidian, yet truly evergreen, issue of the price tag. So I'll begin with a brief introduction to Vigée Lebrun and a visual analysis of the Countess von Schoenfeld with her daughter to underscore the painting's graceful appeal and establish the relationship between the artist and her subject. Vigée Lebrun is remembered as one of the more prominent and prolific artists of the, of the late 18th century in France. She was a critical figure in the flow from the Rococo into neoclassicism with her aristocratic yet intimate subject matter and luscious color palettes driving more from the former and her dignified painterly style evoking the latter. The precocious daughter of established artist Louise Vigée was painting commissioned portraits by the time she was a teenager. And she married the art dealer and fellow painter Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun when she was 21. Vigée Lebrun fled with Julie, her daughter, during the French Revolution in 1789. Her close association with the royal court of Marie Antoinette made her a natural target of revolutionary ire. The pair proceeded to spend 12 years in Italy, Austria, Russia, and Germany. And this portrait, produced during her Viennese sojourn, 
is an exquisite example of Vijay Lebrun's expressive and refined style. We see a young member of the Austrian nobility sitting facing the viewer, enjoying a moment of refined repose with her daughter. A faint yet fond smile crosses her face as she trades embraces with the happy little girl who seems to be fresh from a frolic. The portrait's composition echoes high Renaissance depictions of the Madonna and child and is imbued with a sweet spirit of maternal affection that recurs throughout the youth of Vichy Le Brun. The decorative stone column and balustrades before a dramatic mountainous vista conjure a gently theatrical fantasy of regal adventure that is quite rare in Vichy Le Brun's body of work. The unique landscape setting highlights the picturesque and imaginative quality of her close friendship with the sitter. And so the port portrait's completion in 1793 thus begins its provenance. And I've included copies of correspondence in their entirety here, but I'll be summarizing their contents for you and pointing out pertinent details throughout. The portrait remained in the possession of the Countess's descendants until its sale in 1937 which is the topic of this letter sent from Vienna to Baron Eugène de Rothschild, who was a fifth generation member of the Rothschild family, descended from the Austrian branch on May 30th, 1934. The left is the original German and the right is its French translation. The letter is composed of a rhapsodic visual description of the painting, which is brimming with evocative descriptions of colors and their effects that are unfortunately somewhat lost in translation. Its purpose, however, is quite clear to vividly acquaint the Baron with the portrait so he could entice a potential buyer. We can thus identify with reasonable confidence, despite the lack of signature on this particular document, the Viennese letter writer as the Count of Schoenfeld. On March 30th, Georges Seligman, the nephew of renowned French art dealer Jacques Seligman, sends the Baron a query regarding the protracted negotiations with an unnamed museum that seemed to have at last gone cold. Jacques Seligman & Co. was a prominent French dealer of fine and decorative art and antiques that played a critical role in fostering international appreciation and demand for European art. In these letters, Seligman requests that the Baron allow them to discontinue their efforts to sell the painting. The very next day, the Baron sends his response, which grants them an extension of the original deadline they had set for its sale. Georges Seligman responds on April 2nd, assuring the Baron that a solution would be found. So the next piece of correspondence dates from June 14th, and the initial letter to the Baron indicated that they had spent several years trying to sell the painting without much success. Ultimately, Seligman & Co. Um, ended up acquiring the painting jointly with M. Nodler & Co. in New York, which was at the time another very important art dealership. To further corroborate the details of this transaction, the painting has a handwritten entry in an Endo Blanco stock book, confirming that it was purchased on June 28, 1937. The scholarly benefit of having two of the period's most active and well-established art dealers collaborate on the Vigée Lebrun acquisition is that both archives maintain sets of correspondence with their own financial records, allowing for more confident and accurate claims to be made on otherwise challenging issues of provenance. This will prove to be even more crucial in the painting's second sale, to the esteemed entrepreneur and philanthropist, Samuel H. Kress, in 1950. Kress visited the Seligmans multiple times over several months, deliberating over which artworks he would acquire through the recently established Kress Foundation. In January of 1950, Germain Seligman sent a letter to Kress, encouraging him to consider several works by Bouchardon, Fragonard, and R. Vigée Lebrun. The subject of the painting was referred throughout most of this correspondence as the Countess de Fries, her maiden name rather than Countess von Schoenfeld. This invitation was ultimately accepted as a couple of weeks later, he sends Kress a list of price quotes asking $45,000 for the portrait of the Countess. On May 4th, 1950, Seligman sends another letter to Kress inquiring about his decision whether or not he would acquire the works because Seligman is traveling to Europe soon and would like to come to an agreement. On May 10th, Seligman sends Kress a quote for an acquisition of five artworks, four paintings, one of which, one of which is our Vigée Le Brun, and one marble sculpture, asking for a total of $269,000 for the group. Due to his imminent European departure, he reduces the total by $50,000 to encourage the Kress Foundation's acquisition. Kress sends him a letter the following day requesting that the paintings be delivered to a Professor Modestini in New York, with a sculpture being dropped off at his brother's apartment with the butler. 
He confirms that the foundation will send a check for $190,000. The last letter here is a letter from a delighted Selig de Press confirming the details of the purchase. And as I mentioned previously, the fact that two archives may feature a great deal of overlapping correspondence is a great benefit here. Rather than just having a sea of identical replicas to wade through, they often will contain handwritten originals or discarded drafts from their respective benefactors that provide vital context on a particular detail that may be missing from their counterparts' correspondence. The majority of my primary source documents came from Smithsonian's Jacques Seligman and Co. archives, as they are the link between the painting's original owner through the Baron de Rothschild and its eventual donor to the UAMA. The letters in the Seligman archives indicate that there was a significant drop in the final price from 269,000 to 190,000, with no clear proof on how that happened. Even with the $50,000 discount that Seligman had promised, that would have only reduced it to 219,000, leaving nearly $30,000 unaccounted for. And to my further confusion, the official receipt record for the acquisition of the Vigée Lebrun was that its price is $29,000. And so the file of documents that I received from the kind archivist at the Kress Foundation answered my questions. It had a copy of the same letter that Seligman sent to Kress on May 10th with the identical list of artworks and the originally proposed price for the whole group, 269,000. Handwritten in pencil next to each one, however, as we see in the letter in the center here, is a price. The prices for each work quoted in one of an early letters that Kress received from Seligman in January. The portrait of the Countess von Schoenfeld had 45, taken the name 45,000, written immediately to the left of the artist's name in alignment with prices for each of the remaining paintings and the sculpture. Further to the left of this handwritten column was a second set of numbers, still in pencil. The price for the Vigée Lebrun had dropped to 30. Cress, either from an unrecorded discussion with Seligman or perhaps a consultation with his trusted restorer, Stephen S. Piquetto, had arrived at lower prices for every work in this proposed acquisition. This column is crossed out in pen, however, an uncharacteristically haphazard squiggle runs down the line of figures, and next to that is a final tally that adds up to a large 190 at the bottom, again assumed to mean 190,000. And Kress ultimately paid 29,000 for the Vigée Le Brun painting on May 10th, 1950, which, to my great joy, finally solved the discrepancy between the correspondence in the Seligman archive and the receipt. And we are all familiar by now with the Kress Foundation's generous gift to the UAMA. Aside from several high-profile traveling exhibitions to institutions such as the National Gallery of Art and the Fine Art Museums of San Francisco, the Vigée Le Brun portrait has largely, largely remained on proud and perennial display in the Crest Collection Gallery. And so as I discussed in my introduction, the provenance of the Countess von Schoenfeld with her daughter is in several important ways blessedly straightforward. The complete list of owners is brief. There's a great deal of documentation concerning the sale of the painting. And the materials in the various archives support and provide deeper context into many crucial details, such as price negotiations. I do hope to have made a meaningful contribution, however small, to our collective knowledge about this beautiful portrait and its odyssey from the foothills of the Austrian Alps to the Sonoran Catalinas. Thank you. Thank you, Sedona. I just remind the audience that um, if you have questions as we go along, to please record them in the chat and we'll be taking questions after our last speaker, who is Nicholas McCullough. I invite you, Nicholas, to share your screen. Thank you, Dr. Romano. All right, I hope everyone can see my screen. Ojas René's portrait of the Marquesa Cunegonda Michitelli with her infant son and his nurse, painted in Rome in 1830 during his tenure as the head of the French Academy in Rome, represents at its most base level the depiction of a mother, her child, and her servant. However, this particular portrait possesses a backstory that is worthy of unpacking and which contributes to its legacy and value for both the Crest Collection and the University of Arizona's Museum of Art. While it was shown in the Salon exhibition of 1833 under the title Portrait of a Roman Lady with Her Child, the name by which this piece is now known helpfully provides an identity for the most important character in the portrait, and by extension, gives a wider hint into the compelling provenance of Vernet's work itself. The woman seated at the keyboard is the Marquise, who was likely born sometime during the 1790s or even the very first years of the 1800s in Città de la Pieve by Piagaro a small village in Umbria, 
known for its beautiful glass making artisans. Her father was Nobile Gian Felice Cocci of Citta della Pieva, the patriarch of the local noble family. While few records besides his name exist, however, Gian Felice's daughter did make a certain impact upon her home region through her marriage. When she became the bride of the young Marquis Jeremia Michatelli de Montegiove, according to records from Giagaro, the Marquis purchased an ancient glassworks factory and revitalized it, thus connecting both the Cochis and the Michatellis with the wealth and influence that would have been required in order to commission a work from Horace Vernet, who, during this period, was at the height of his career, his artistic production, and his popularity, thus wielding significant influence within Rome, his native France, and the wider European artistic community. While unsurprisingly, there is no evidence to provide a background for the nurse, there is also no record for the child painted in the portrait that can be found. The most basic facts, his name, age, and even any verifiable proof that he was of the male gender are not known, and Vernet himself does not provide any other clues. Much of this biographical and familial information has thus been obtained through correspondence between surviving members of the Michitelli family, including the former Marquis Paolo Michitelli, but few other sources beyond passing references in genealogical and historical surveys of the regions in which the Cochis and Michitelli families lived exists, beyond the family archives in Piagaro, to which Paolo Michitelli referred in a 1969 letter between himself and Henry Hecht, an assistant curator of the Crest Foundation. The Michitelli family, which has possessed the title of Marquis since 1824 when it was granted to them by Pope Leo XII, is one of the hundreds of noble Italian families listed in the 346 page volume Libro di Oro della Nobilità Italiana, maintained by the Collegio Araldico in Rome, which details the names and titles of every registered and legitimate noble family in Italy. Besides the Michitelli family, all of the other families connected to this portrait appear on the list, the Cochis, the Colocci Vespucci's, and the Honorati. The main figure in Vernet's portrait, the Marquise, was the first wife of the Marquis Jeremia Antonio Michitelli, who was born in 1793 and appears to have been the youngest son of Don Carlo Michitelli. The Marquis Jeremia married Cunegonda in 1815, when he was approximately 22 years old. While possible that she was older than Jeremia, since her own birthday cannot be ascertained, given the systems of noble marriages and young brides in Europe during the early 19th century, which often saw young women married off as soon as they first underwent menstruation, she herself might have been as young as 15 at the time of her marriage. The Vernet portrait was completed in 1830 when the Marquis and possibly the Marquise were both in their 30s, and the Marquis herself died in 1842, leaving the door open to Jeremia's later marriages. As listed both in the records of the Crest Foundation and the University of Arizona Museum of Art, Vernet's portrait possesses a fairly straightforward and short provenance with few apparent gaps. From the Marchesa Cunegonda Cochi Michatelli, it went to a Marchesa Colocci Vespucci Honorati. From the Colocci Vespucci family, it was acquired by Count Alessandro Contini Bonacossi, who then sold it to Samuel H. Cress on the 1st of June, 1936. Crest then gifted it to the University of Arizona Museum of Art in 1961, although it had been first exhibited in 1951, along with the other original 24 Crest works brought to Tucson. While both Crest and the Count Contini Bonacossi, with whom Crest often collaborated during his Italian expeditions in the 1920s through to the 1940s to purchase works of art, are well-known figures within the world of art collecting and art history, the remaining two members of this brief provenance list have proven to be much more enigmatic. One of the largest mysteries concerning the provenance of the portrait of the Marchesa Michetelli is how it ended up in the hands of the very second individual within the provenance list, the Marchesa Colocci Vespucci Honorati. While Paolo Michetelli, a descendant of Cunegonda's husband, the documents from the Crest Collection Foundation and the accession sheet and the records of the University Museum all detail the painting as having passed from the Michitelli collection to the Colocci Vespucci's through familial ties, there seems to be no actual proof of such a connection beyond the assertions of Paolo Michitelli, who himself admitted that he knew of no existing close familial ties between the Colocci Vespucci and the Michitelli families. Thus, why was the portrait then owned by a member of the Colocci Vespucci family? 
Researching ties between the two clans has proven fruitless. At first, acting upon the assumption by Paolo Michitelli that the two families were related, numerous genealogical trees and ancestral records were studied to find links, although none could be identified. The Michitelli, being one of the noble families of Italy and descended from Pope Leo XII, are connected to several other very powerful families, including the Ravizza, Berlinghieri, Rospigliosi, Pallavicini, and Barberini families. And of course, the Vespucci family itself is not unknown either. They claim descendants from the explorer Amerigo Vespucci himself. And the Colocci and Vespucci families were linked in 1853 when Enriqueta Vespucci married Antonio Colocci. However, even with such a lengthy accumulation of relatives, no distinct ties between the Colocci Vespucci families and the Michitellis or their cadet branch, the Michitelli Mosinigo Saranzos, can be identified. A further attempt to uncover the degrees of relation between these two names in the Verne portrait's provenance also proved unsuccessful. A study of the lineage of the Marquise's own family showed no connection between her maiden name, Cocci, and any Colocci or Vespucci relations. While this is by no means a definitive rejection of the idea of a blood connection, no evidence for this particular project was unearthed. And the ancient trees of the Italian nobility, as well as the country's own fractured history have proven difficult to unravel. Even seeking to find any connection between the two main families was difficult. The Michitelli family, which originated in Alfinia, had primarily established itself in the region of Umbria and Rome, specifically in Ripe, Orvieto, Montegabioni and Terni and Piegarro. The Colocci Vespucci family, on the other hand, had come from Peretola and had settled largely in the region of Florence, Naples, and Terni. The Colocci Vespucci family as well had come from Peretola and had settled in the region of Florence with branches of the Vespucci family living in Florence, Genoa, and Naples. The Colocci family as well dominated the scenery of Yezi and Ancona and there are few geographic overlaps to indicate any interaction between these two families, much less any intermarriages. All of these factors of distinction would indicate that the familial connection is rather more obscure than even Paolo Michitelli himself believed. Similarly, as discussed in the notes for this portrait from the Crest Foundation, few substantive references by Vernet himself to this work of the Marquise and her child exist. And the members of the Michitelli family indicate in correspondence that they also had no knowledge of this particular depiction of a member of their own family. The Crest Foundation attributes such a notable omission within Vernet's oeuvre to the confusing period immediately following the completion of the work, which makes sense given that the year of 1830 saw considerable upheaval within Rome amongst revolutions of 1830s, as well as the Carbonari uprising. The ignorance of the Michitelli family too can be explained. The Marquise Cunegonda was only the first of three wives for the Marquise Jeremia, and she and all children born from that first relationship predeceased the Marquis at an early age. Their surviving descendants stem from the Marquis's second and third marriages, and it can thus be easily understood then how little information might exist of the first wife. Therefore, in studying the portrait of the Marquesa Cunegonda Michitelli with her infant son and his nurse, it becomes clear that even if answers have not yet been readily provided, this work has a story to tell beyond the simple depiction of a mother and her household, which is a sentiment that the burgeoning and crucial field of provenance research has continually emphasized. While not every piece possesses heartrending stories of, or histories of tragedy and persecution, they all compel the viewer to assess, to question, and to reflect upon the lives and periods that these objects have inhabited and will continue to do so. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Nicholas. I'll turn it back over to Olivia. Thank you all so much. Definitely a round of applause for all of the speakers. Um, I, I really want to stress, um, you know, when Samuel Kress made the decision to donate his collection of roughly 3,000 objects to museums across the country, I think this is exactly the sort of engagement that he was hoping would happen. You know, he really wanted um, people all over the country to be able to experience artwork and have the opportunity to um, have close access to it and research it. And, um, you know, this is why we have a, a museum at the university is so um, students can get these sorts of experiences. Um, but I also want to stress that that we at the museum are extremely grateful 
uh, when students do research, you know, we have 6,000 objects in the collection and um, all of the research that is done, we keep. And, um, you know, it, it stays part of our permanent files and this, um, you know, creates another stepping, stepping stone for future researchers to keep building um, the history of these objects. So thank you all for your, your contributions to, to the museum. Um, so again, please leave your questions in the chat. There are a couple here. Um, so the first one is for Emily. This one's from Dr. Cuneo. So in the 1940s, as a result of the ongoing and then the conclusion of World War II, there was a fair bit of anti-German sentiment throughout Europe and the States. Can you speculate on why Dre and the Kress family might have wanted to purchase and own the Cronach? Do you have any thoughts about that? That's an excellent question, Dr. Cuneo. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I may honestly not have a very specific answer for it, but I do believe that perhaps the fact that they thought it was an, a Cranach, uh, he himself had only worked on it, um, which later further research had concluded he was, uh, it was part of his studio work probably, um, would have maybe been a reason perhaps for it to be purchased, if that makes sense. Dr. Romano, would you have any additional thoughts to that? Well, um, first I'll say we don't know a lot about the Paul Dre gallery. Uh, we do know that, um, that Dre and his family were Jewish and they had these connections in London with um, a German emigres who, uh, including one of his relatives who left Germany and set up a dealership in London. And still in that period of the 1940s and even into the late 1940s after World War II, there was a rather fluid art market that um, comprised dealers who including Nazi dealers who had um, work in, in Germany and they set up um, satellite shops and relationships in other countries. So you have a dealer that might have a, like Julius Burler, the, the dealer that Emily mentioned, whose main business was in Munich, but he also had dealerships in, uh, in Paris uh, and in New York and in Lucerne. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how much the anti-German sentiment comes into it when it came to great works of, of German art. Um, Emily mentioned actually that, that that particular work of art was in both in 1934 and 38 was on the list of, of um, important works of art in Germany and would have been uh, therefore not exportable that that work of art should have remained in Germany and somehow made it out. I mean, that's what we're interested in knowing exactly how. All right, thank you. Um, so this next question is for Nicholas. This is from Lauren Rabb. Um, so she writes, I wonder if there could be a connection between the Marquis's last wife and the Colocci family. Uh, that's a very interesting question. And one of the things that I didn't have time to discuss in my own presentation, um, I tend to be long winded, was that um, I had a few theories myself about why this portrait ended up, for example, because I couldn't find any familial, that does not mean, of course, that they didn't know each other. And so a few of my theories might have been that either um, the Marquis, once his first wife has died, um, he's too devastated to keep a reminder of his wife and former child in the house and so decided to gift it to a friend or neighbor, something like that. But um, when I was, I did research the Marquis' um, other two um, wives. Um, one of them was um, Antonia de la Chaya and the other one, the last wife who you're referring to is Maria Ravitsa. Um, there wasn't a connection that I could find between the Ravitsas and um, the Colocci family. Um, the Ravitsa family lived primarily in Milan. Um, but again, this is also speculative because I, I don't have a way of, of proving that these families weren't in, um, interconnected. Um, and one of the things that I think all of us struggled with during for this particular project was um, much of our research was um, taking place last semester during the big closure of the library, the research facilities. And so um, a lot of my own personal research was um, undertaken um, primarily through internet websites um, and, and um, you know, genealogical books that were PDF scanned. Um, and so I'll be the first to admit that you know, there are definitely links that I could have missed, but um, from my own personal experience, um, I wasn't able to determine um, a, a physical connection between any of the members of the Michetelli family um, or, 
or, or the, uh, the, the next one, the honorati, uh, the Marquesa honorati. So um, that's a super interesting question. I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but um, from my own research, I wasn't able to, to identify a link. That's great. I mean, sometimes the, you know, the lack of answers are just as important as finding an answer. So, you know, it, it lets us know where the gaps are and, um, you know, maybe there's something to it or, or not. Um, you did bring up a point, though. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think we stressed so much the challenges with uh, research. You know, normally this would be the type of project where we would have all the students come in and be able to look at the objects. You know, we would take them off the wall, let them see the back of it. And, um, you know, we really had to rely on, on email and scans and they were very patient throughout the process and I think still wrote really incredible papers and did really wonderful research. Um, let me just double check. Um, are there any other questions for our speakers? So we can put them in the chat. I think I have a general question for anybody who wants to answer it. Um, you know, I'm kind of interested in knowing what you found. I mean, we've acknowledged the challenges with it being um, the pandemic and the research, but um, was there sort of a favorite part that stuck out to you or um, kind of a favorite discovery that you made that, that stood out? I think provenance research is really fun in terms of the different kinds of records you can find. Um, so I'm just wondering if any of you had that experience. I'd love to respond to first if that's okay. Yes, it does. Um, thank you. Yeah. So something that I, I really loved about this process was um, getting to delve into the correspondence and you got such a sense of um, of these collectors and dealers' personalities. And it it had such a vivid kind of um, portrait of not just the transaction between those two um, two people, but kind of the, the time and the cultural tastes and what um, e motivation each party had. And, and it was really, um, really gripping at times to, to read some of this correspondence. And so that was very enjoyable. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you pointed out, you know, Crest did a bit of negotiating for that painting. And yes. um, you know, it, it is interesting to kind of learn about, you know, how those things were done and, um, and kind of the, the economy around um, the art trade, you know, it's mm -hmm. interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Emily, I, I think you maybe wanted to mention something as well. Um, I would I would agree as well with Sedona. And then I think one of the more fun things when I found out was the um, the Cranach Studio painting with, was in the uh, National Gallery of Art with John F. Kennedy. That was one of those things where it was like, oh, I've been in a painting with the same room as John F. Kennedy was in. You know, that was one of those kind of awe-inspiring moments to me to realize that. Um, and it just goes to show how, how much um, there's an aura around these paintings that we may not even realize yet. Uh, and that can go for any painting ever in the museum. Yeah, it's almost like you get this six degrees of separation <laughs> but with a painting instead of a, a person. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I think that's why people describe, you know, provenance as um, sort of telling the biography of a painting, you know, it's who, who did this painting meet? You know, it sounds kind of silly, but I think, uh, I think there's a reason why that word is used, so. Um, well, are there any last questions? Olivia, somebody asked, and maybe you could answer this, if um, it is still the practice that um, stickers are put on the backs of paintings when they go on loan. And you've had paintings go around the world <laughs> lately. I'm that is a great question. I will say it, it is falling out of practice. I think there's... Um, I think there's a general consensus that, you know, um, we don't want to keep putting adhesives and things like that on the backs of paintings. With that said, you know, our Jackson Pollock did travel to um, uh, the Royal Academy in London and they did, and that was, I don't know, probably six years ago and they did put a sticker on it and that kind of shocked us because it had been some time since we had seen that. So it, it seems like there's a couple institutions that still do that, but for the most part, um, you know, there's other ways that we can document um, the artwork and the exhibition. But um, I will say anytime, you know, some of the stickers are very, very old and very, very brittle. And at times they do fall off of the painting and we absolutely save those and they go into the object's permanent file because as you, as you so wonderfully demonstrated in your introduction, they're hugely important um, to telling the story, so. All right, thank you all so much. 
Um, I hope you will join us and we do have some more wonderful events happening this spring. I'm just going to put the link in um, the chat. So if you want to take a look at any upcoming events at the museum, um, you know, please join us. And thank you all so much. And thank you again to Dr. Romano and the students, Sedona, Emily and Nicholas. Thank you.